All right, thank you. Um, so just to kind of set the stage here, I'm going to run through a bunch of botnet takedowns. Raise your hand and keep your hand up if you are familiar with any of these. Ever heard of Torpig in UC Cal Berkeley? Um, Bredo Lab, Dutch Police, uh, Core Flood, FBI taking over botnet. Uh, any of the ones that Microsoft has done, Rustock, Walladeck, more recently, no IP, DNS seizures. Um, Mariposa botnet in Spain. Okay, so a number of you are uh, vaguely familiar. You may not realize there's this sort of uh, growing frustration that people have with what's been going on in terms of cybercrime. And I, I bet if I asked how many people here have directly or in your immediate family have had credit card numbers stolen or your computer compromised and have to clean it up. So it, at least the impact on computers is starting to be pretty prevalent, uh, financial losses and, and bigger. So I, I wanted to uh, thank the program committee for allowing this discussion uh, because of the involvement of you guys. And I want to mention that uh, Department of Homeland Security has been funding some research going back a number of years uh, to try to look at the ethical uh, issues regarding computer security research. And that's starting to bleed into the operational realm, so we're continuing to, to look at that as well. And the reason that I'm here is to kind of discuss some of these activities that are going on. So if you were to assume that there was some kind of an advisory body that wanted to work with groups like the AV industry, Microsoft, law enforcement, to try to take it, uh, some of these criminal botnets down, take them out of control of, of uh, criminals. Uh, what is your role? Are you involved at all? And I want to try to have this dialogue with you to understand how does this community who's going after these botnets supposed to be interacting with network providers and platform providers. Uh, Paul Vixie has been talking for a while, and, he, and this talk is based on something that he mentioned, saying range of the moment, whack-a-mole. Uh, a lot of times when people are trying to take over botnets, they don't fully take them out of control, the bad guys, and a lot of people feel that the only way to really stop this is to actually get people behind bars or get them in front of a court. So part of this is about how do you have a more lasting impact on crime, but doing it in a way that minimizes the potential harm. And a lot of this frustration is due to the legal process. And in democratic societies, the law is supposed to be deliberative. It's supposed to be fair. In the United States, you're innocent until you're proven guilty. But when somebody finds evidence of crime, because a customer has been compromised and you find evidence of something that some criminals are doing, you may report it to law enforcement and all of a sudden you don't hear anything. And months later you still don't hear anything. And you think, I gave information to law enforcement, how come somebody has not been arrested? Well, the legal process is slow. And it's slow for a number of reasons. And there are multiple parts to it. So a lot of people don't understand there's civil process. Microsoft has been using civil legal process, temporary restraining orders, uh, primarily to take assets out of control of somebody who's using them to commit crime. The criminal process, you give information to law enforcement, the government, under their authorities, based on law, they will go prosecute somebody. But if something is in the grand jury, the grand jury is a secretive process. It's supposed to be in order to protect innocent people. So if you give something to law enforcement and they're actually investigating something, don't expect them to say anything about it. They can't confirm that there's an investigation going on. They can't say anything about the process. And if you are trying to do something, and most of these botnets span the globe, so if you're trying to do something involving criminal process and it involves law enforcement or evidence that has to be obtained from a different country, MLAT is Mutual Legal Assistance Treaty, and it's a process that can take sometimes a year or more to fully execute. So while there is more cooperation between law enforcement agencies around the world, 
certain things still take a really long time. Now, if we're talking about doing really aggressive things to try to take control away from bad guys, uh, this is kind of a little humorous example, but it really makes the point. So in this uh, Indiana Jones movie, they had this scene that was choreographed where this scimitar-wielding guy is attacking Indiana Jones. And the people who are standing around in the market, they're far enough away. So if the guy with the scimitar is swinging it, nobody's going to get hurt. And Indiana Jones was supposed to use his uh, uh, whip to take care of this. Harrison Ford actually had dysentery during this scene. And he said, look, I, this is taking way too much time. I just want to get out of here. What if I pull my gun out and shoot the guy? So he pulls his gun out and he shoots him. And take, you know, it's a great scene. Everybody loves it. It's really funny. He's using deadly force against somebody who is not even close to him. But look at all the people standing behind. So... <laughs> He's much more likely to actually kill somebody who's innocent than he is to kill the bad guy. And even if he kills the bad guy, in the act of killing the bad guy, the bullet may overpenetrate and may hit some innocent person. So the whole idea is you need to think about all of the stakeholders are involved. Everyone who is in this scene here. And with the internet, it's very difficult to see the people that are standing right behind the bad guy. Or in terms of networks and platforms, the people who are standing in front are the, the thing that are at risk. So I've been involved in studying this for a really long time. Uh, I was the first person to understand the technical aspects of distributed denial of service attacks in 1999 and realized this is a really hard problem. It involves sometimes hundreds of sites. And you'll find that you know, your customers or your parents or your relatives fall at the very bottom of the scale. They may not know very much. They may not have much ability to do anything. So if they're involved in some kind of a criminal act and there's some evidence that they possess, law enforcement will have a hard time getting it. And they won't have much impact if they're going to try to get involved. Where most of the people in this room fall is in level two or three, hopefully three, where your organization investigates abuse reports, they investigate complaints that involve criminal activity, gather information, pass it along to other people, operate or discuss in closed venues what's going on, how to deal with it so that the bad guys don't learn and encounter that. But every now and then you'll find that somebody knows something that's critical, and because of all these other entities that are have it working at a lower capacity and can't really help, you hit this level four where you have the ability to do something, you may need to do it, but you're kind of falling into a gray area, if not strictly breaking the law. So this level four, we found, has various levels as well. And it's going from top to bottom, less risk, less intrusiveness, down to more risk and more intrusiveness at the bottom. And just gathering information, if you have a password, there's a cache of credit cards or something on someone's system and they have no ability to do anything or they refuse to do something, but you know something that will allow you to get this information, you may be tempted to do that. It may be a violation of law because you're accessing a system without authorization. Now you have people who want to go in and shut things down. They're being attacked. They feel like I have this right to stop things. And how many people here remember the Berman Kobel bill back in like 2003, 2004? They were debating how, letting the motion picture industry and the recording industry have an exemption from the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, allowing them to enter into the computers of people who they believed were sharing copyright material to disable the network interface or disable the software that was running. How many people here remember the Sony Root Kit from 2004? <laughs> okay, so at least. That one, a lot of people are, are understanding. You want to protect your intellectual property on this CD. It installs a rootkit on the system that allows them to determine when somebody is trying to copy material and shut it down. Well, it happened to have a back door, so there was a whole bunch of problems. You didn't have any way of uninstalling it. So the main point here is all of these things at this level, you're doing something with assets that are owned by somebody else, it's outside of your zone of authority, 
and you're not doing it with their cooperation, in some cases without even their knowledge. If you are going to be trying to do this with a goal of completely eradicating the malware, it's a botnet that has a million infected computers, and you know that the bad guy is using them, and you want to take them out of their hands. It's pretty simple to just run a piece of malware in a sandbox, get passwords, and a whole bunch of things that you can do to learn how it's functioning. But then when you start trying to figure out how to bypass encryption to defeat uh, any protection mechanisms that the malicious software may have, or try to break into the command and control infrastructure, it takes a lot of knowledge. It takes deep reverse engineering, some intimate knowledge of TCP IP and how the operating system functions. And so this graph, it's a notional graph, but as you go farther and farther down this path of technical difficulty to achieve a difficult objective, taking over the botnet or shutting it down and cleaning it up, risk goes up probably much more than the technical difficulty. So you end up getting in this space where as you're talking about doing certain things, blocking domain names. If there's a piece of malware that intercepts requests to search engines and directs those to some system that injects code or alters the results so that it's pointing you at, at some site that you don't want to go, by stopping that, you may cause a web application to cease functioning. And how many people here have been in the doctor's office lately and seen the doctor log into this web app and start Googling for certain medical things to try and understand how to diagnose, treat your condition? So what if those systems stop work? What if systems in an operating room, operating room stop functioning? So how do you think about all this stuff? Uh, one of the foundation things is integrity. And this is a, a lawyer, Stephen Carter. He's written a book on this. And his definition, integrity, means you know what is right and what is wrong based on your experience growing up, training, and that you make your decisions and you act based on your knowledge of what is right and wrong, even if that means that it costs you personally because you're doing what you think is the right thing, and that you're able to clearly articulate how you came to that decision. You don't just say, I'm doing this because I'm an ethical person. You do it because you say, there's a certain principle, I'm trying to uphold this principle, you're balancing that against other ethical principles. And when you think about ethics, uh, you know, I'm not a philosopher, but I've read a lot about this, so you'll see some things here that are uh, a little bit familiar. There, there's this framework based on norms and rules. And if you follow rules, the Bible says thou shalt not kill. So in a time of war, some Christians will say, cannot go to war because you're killing people, you're violating what the Bible says. So under this, torture is always wrong, you never should do it, doesn't matter what. And that brings up the conflict, the no matter what part. What are the consequences? If you focus on the outcomes rather than the rules, you may say, if I save a certain number of lives, torturing somebody is worthwhile. Or, and this gets into uh, anti-abortion, you kill an abortionist, you're saving some unknown number of lives, therefore, the fact that it's murder doesn't matter. There is a higher law, this consequence is the thing that's most important. So those directly conflict with each other. There's this other philosophy of virtue ethics, where you don't focus on the rules, you don't focus on the actions, you focus on who's doing them. And you look at what is their history? Do they, have they exhibited over time the ability to reason through things and come to decisions that are similar and that are consistent over time? And so under the virtue ethics perspective, and this is from a book on virtue ethics in regard to war. If you're the right person doing the right thing at the right time, you know all of these are, you're showing that you are the right person and that you are doing the right thing. And you're comparing that with other things that would be the wrong thing and being able to explain 
how you came to this decision of what you're going to do. In the internet community, internet research community, um, Annette Markham, is a, she is a philosopher, and has done some work on how your ethical uh, framework should exhibit itself in your research protocols and vice versa. So taking down botnets, trying to stop cybercrime, arguably is a world-fixing act. You want to do something good for a certain group of people, but what, are, what is that group of people? Who are those stakeholders? Is the thing that you're doing something that they would say, I want you to do, I think that's a good thing for you to do? Or would they say, what the hell? Why did you do that? You just cost me something. You just impacted me in a negative way, and I wasn't being bothered before, but now I'm bothered. So need to interpret what people, in, what people will um, take out of whatever your actions are in deciding what those actions should be. So the Part Department of Homeland Security has been looking at this since uh, 2009 in terms of research ethics, like I say. And there is a published report we call the Menlo Report and a companion guide. I neglected to put the companion guide in the references that are in the back of the slide deck. Uh, you can find it on my homepage. I may try to update the slides and put them at the URL that was on the slides here. So we have this document out now. We're trying to socialize it in the research community. Catherine Carpenter and I are socializing it in the operational community and trying to you know, come up with some way of changing the way that we look at these things. And the, you'll see that under respect for persons, an informed consent is the concept that people think of a lot. You should tell people what you're doing. They should opt in or have the ability to opt out. Uh, identifying who the stakeholders are is the first step to figuring out how to engage with people and get their permission. So there are three principal groups. The primary stakeholders are those people who you are arguably trying to benefit the primary beneficiaries of whatever this goodness is that you're trying to deliver. And because there are criminals who are doing malicious things against them, you want to understand who benefits negatively from the stuff that's going on. There's an ecosystem. People sell credit cards. They sell virtual private network services that prevent traceback. They do bulletproof hosting so that you don't get takedowns of resources. Uh, so there, the secondary stakeholder population are ones who are intermediaries in delivery. So network providers, platform providers. And the key stakeholders are those people who are acting, who actually have an impact on the outcome. So you as a researcher trying to understand something, or the bad guys who are using this resource to try to steal credit cards to gain financially. So you want to you know, put people into the, the, the proper groups. Now, this diagram comes from a paper that Catherine and I did on distance and how you try to incorporate the fact that the internet is a system of system. And users of platforms are far distant in some cases from the network that you may be studying or manipulating, or the devices that you may be talking about. So this uses the sort of blue-red methodology when you're talking about war and the good actors and the bad actors. Uh, in that case, blue means you're a good guy, red means you're a bad guy, green means you're neutral. And there are various shades of green here because there are all kinds of neutral parties who are intermediaries in the blue actors trying to go after the red actors. So you see that the red actor in the middle of this big platform service user bubble at the top, they may be using stolen resources. They may look like a bad guy, or they may look like a good guy because they're part of this network. And if you're doing something against them, the blue entity at the bottom, say they decide we are going to prevent this service from functioning by doing a denial service attack against it. So now you may be sending a flood of traffic the flood of traffic goes through the network providers at the bottom, goes through the platform provider. If you disrupt the networks in transit, 
you affect a bunch of innocent third parties. If you affect the platform, you have Im impact negatively this huge number of people at the top. If you said those were the ones that you were trying to serve, but you actually do something to harm them, that's not the outcome that you want. So I'll walk through a case here just to kind of you know go through this from the perspective of looking at all the stakeholders and trying to understand who benefits, who gains. Is this the right way to do something? And this case is based on a system called HyperVM, which is a virtualization platform that's used for creating storefronts. And Cloxo is the administrative front end of the system. It was developed by a company in India. Now, somebody anonymously, nobody knows who it is, looks at this thing and discovers, I think it was over 100 vulnerabilities, many of which would give you full root access command and control of the whole thing. So contacts the vendor and says, I found all these bugs. I have a proof of concept. It's on my web server. You need to fix this. And gets a response back a couple days later from somebody, and it wasn't named. Sure, I'll look into this. Guy waits a week, or gal, whoever. Nobody knows. Could be a dog. Week later, hey, you haven't looked at the stuff. You need to look at it. Person says, sorry for the delay. I'll take a look at it in the next couple of hours. Still have no idea who it is that's responding. A couple days later, still hasn't touched it. OK, the person who did the research gets pissed off, says, all right, these guys are not doing anything. I'm trying to fix this because well, they want to save everybody who uses it. So makes it fully available. Full disclosure, the whole thing. The, a day later? Somebody breaks into a site, VA cert in the UK. They have 100,000 users on the system. Person uses the vulnerability, wipes out everything on the whole system. And they weren't doing backups properly. So 100,000 users, many of whom were small businesses, they're completely out of business for days while they try to recover. So following day, the CEO of the company is found dead of suicide. Now. Who knows? Probably didn't commit suicide just because of this. May have been other stress. Why wasn't somebody answering right away? Who knows? But how Cert CC, if you were to go to Cert CC with this vulnerability, their guidelines say 45 days. If the vendor doesn't respond in 45 days, then figure out how to escalate. Um, the Organization for Internet Safety, they have a 30-day grace period. This person waited at most about a week. Uh, but And the second time, it, it wasn't even that. So if you look at who's involved from a stakeholder perspective, the researcher obviously, if this was a good outcome, probably would have gone public and said who they were. They didn't. They're anonymous. So from an integrity perspective, they're not saying what they're doing and why they're doing it. They're not taking credit for it. They're not being open and transparent. Maybe for personal safety reasons. Who knows? The programmers want to do the right thing, but they're told what to do by the people who pay them. And the vendor, they have their reputation online. They may lose resources or lose revenue uh, because people don't buy this. The service providers have customers. The customers or have clients. Those clients have customers. So VA cert. They had no idea that this was going to be announced. They weren't prepared for it. Uh, as you go through here, and then the criminals who find this information, in this case, what good do you get from destroying 100,000 websites? Not very much. But if there is some other kind of a vulnerability where now you have the ability to go steal credit cards or whatever, uh, heart bleed or something like that, now they're going to act on whatever it is they're given. And so there's this time frame that you have to take into consideration. Um, let's kind of go through a, another use case here to sort of understand how, how you guys all would fit into this. Uh, people are saying that they want to take down criminal botnets because they want to change the equation. They want to increase the cost, deter people from breaking in. And this box in the bottom left here, People who were doing research into Kelios believe 
Wallet or Storm was written by the same people who wrote Wallet Act. Wallet Act was followed on by Kelios. And the red lines here show the family that's in the bottom left. So there is a period of time in January 2010 when Microsoft did the first civil legal TRO, temporary restraining order, uh, to take over a bunch of domains for WalletEck. That caused the botnet to kind of go offline and, and not much activity for about 10 months. But subsequent to that, the next takedown was again Microsoft and some others. Following that, uh, a number of companies and the HoneyNet project took it down in 2012. It was then taken down. How many people here saw or heard of the Kellios takedown at RSA in 2013? Okay, so they did a live takedown on stage. So you notice on the bottom right, in both of those cases, the botnet was back up and running within hours and has basically been continually active since 2011. So just really quickly, back of the envelope calculation, um, how they took 110,000 hosts out. There are some figures from people looking in the underground, cost about maybe 11K to replace the network. And the people who were doing the reverse engineering, at, at $11,000, just at $100 an hour, it's 110 hours. And at least one of the people involved spent more than 100 hours just to do the sinkhole. That's not to keep the sinkhole active for you know, potentially a couple of years. And part of the reason that it comes back so fast is after this one takedown, I went back and just started looking with some basic facts, doing searches, linking facts together, and realized, okay, so there's this ecosystem that's out there. You have in the middle the malware, the little red bubbles. There is a thing called FifeSoc, which affected Facebook and Twitter users to try to get them to click on links to get them infected. And that was dropping software that was rogue AV that tried to steal money. And it dropped Kelios. Kelios spammed. The spamming was also used to try to uh, bring infected computers in. And all of these domains on the, on the far right-hand side, there were a large number of them that had been active for years that weren't really seen to be related other than uh, how many people here remember um, Liza Moon? There was this thing called Liza Moon. It was a SQL injection attack. SQL injection attack caused iframes to be installed that directed you to a browser exploit kit. That was also this infrastructure. So up in the upper left is the sinkholing. If your goal is to just take 110,000 hosts out of the bad guy's hands, but the rest of this infrastructure on the right is still there and it's still functioning, sure, it's going to be back in a couple of hours. And the more times that you try to take this person's infrastructure away, the better they're going to get at making sure that it keeps going. So if you're going to be doing this, um, Catherine and I had talked about a framework and, and there's an effort to try and create a group that will help in, in doing this evaluation. You want to make sure that the good guys are not hurting other good guys. And, and that means private sector and law enforcement or private sector versus private sector. And if we're going to be doing something, there should be some review beforehand to try and understand who are all the stakeholders involved? What is their role? How should you be considering them in terms of risk and benefit for whatever this action is? And then afterwards, review what happens to make sure that you get the right outcome. And that government has a role Policing, that's their authority, not ours. So if you can try to involve them to get criminal outcomes, that's what everybody seems to agree is the best outcome. Get people to stop because they're afraid they're going to go to jail. So at the extreme end of this active response continuum where you might be potentially harming people, try to do it in a way that is the, the, the least damaging. And if you use civil or criminal legal process primarily, rather than just technical means unilaterally, uh, you'll get some better outcomes. And following this virtue ethics, being able to explain what you're doing beforehand and after the fact and, and justifying it in the right way, that's what we believe is the way to go. So here's the interactive time. I want to try and get as much of a discussion going on as possible. So 
a large number of you weren't really aware of some of these botnet takedowns that have been going down, many of which had some impact to the people whose computers were infected, your customer. So I want to know, how do you guys think, guys and gals, how do you think your organization should be involved? Should you just be considered by whoever is going to be planning on doing something? Or should you be actively involved in some way? Should you be engaged in trying to minimize the harm and, and trying to have the, the outcome? That you and what influence do you think you guys have? What limits you? Is there anything legally or contractually or resource-wise that prevents you from being involved? And how should you be? How should your organization be ex expressing its concerns about the really risky thing? You want to disinfect computer. You want to take command and control away in a situation where it might mean that your customers' computers go offline for some reason at a time that nobody knows because you're not involved. How, how should that go? Alexander Lemon, <coughs> Curator Labs. The question is uh, the size of collateral damage. How much uh, unaware people will be affected along with uh, hardware and software that possessed by malware. That's, I think, <coughs> the main part of equation, at least in my opinion. OK, so the collateral damage part is one of the bigger concerns. Uh, how, if, if somebody's going to be trying to take some action, and let's say you're uh, taking domains away, how do you figure out where this collateral damage will be, and how do we minimize it? That's, that's what we're trying to get out of this discussion. Do you see a good way of I have no answer that. to this question, just to see you or do. No question, it's just, you, it has to be considered uh, on a case-per-case -case basis. And if it's uh, just some new domain names that just arrived a few minutes ago through registry to control this botnet, that's one thing. And if you have some third-level uh, domain and if you bring down uh, the third level domain along with good customers, that's a whole other thing. As I said, collateral damage, big part of the equation. If only the bad guys are affected, why would we care if there is some uh, victim users, victimized users affected, then uh, of course uh, some notifications to the uh, network providers and IT services providers should be in order. Okay, so. Um how many people here from DNS providers or entities that are involved with DNS, uh, how many believe that any kind of an action against those domains without your cooperation should not happen? The, the temporary restraining order kind of thing. Anybody, ha or there's somebody in the back here Question in the back? Uh, yeah, um, Andrew Alston from Liquid Telecom. Um, I've got a bit of an interesting perspective on this because one of the questions up there is what limits the organization's ability to be actively involved. Now, where I come from, I can't take a legal route because there is no legal route to be followed. Um, and we sit in a situation, I mean, I'm based in Kenya, we operate in 13 countries across Africa. There are no so cybercrime units there. I can go to the police, I can say, I found this guy on my network and he's attacking half the world and they're going to go, so what? What does that mean? So that is a hugely limiting factor and as the bandwidth grows in an area like Africa, it becomes far more of a threat to the rest of the world. So it puts us in a very difficult position when I've got an American company coming and saying we're being attacked, but at the same time, what can I actually do about it without taking an active approach? Because the criminal uh, and the civil penalties, 
They just don't exist. So I think it also becomes a lot of, uh, there, there's a lot of lobbying that needs to be done there to increase the law enforcement side of things to give us further options. Um, and we're doing that all the time, but it is a, a huge challenge that we are facing currently, and particularly because we are starting to see more and more attacks flowing out of Africa to the rest of the world. There was an incident the other day where a house in Nairobi caught fire, and when the police showed up there, they found 77 Chinese citizens in there, complete with loads and loads of high-tech equipment doing goodness knows what. Um, they arrested a lot of them, and a couple of days later, the Chinese came and said, please extradite these guys, we want our guys back. Draw your own conclusions. What do you do in a situation like that? I'm, I don't know anymore. Um, can I ask then, how much engagement is your company and other companies have with the, basically, the sovereigns in Africa versus other entities to try to get those sovereigns to do something? Because law is passed only if there's enough pressure. We are engaging pretty constantly with various governments um, about the issues and where we can and we do get complaints, obviously we shut down what we can while engagement in the law enforcement community. Um, we do get requests, particularly in areas like Kenya from anti-terrorism units and we cooperate as much as possible while trying to make the point that we'll be able to help them far more if there are better laws. But it's proving to be a very, very slow process and my concern is that the capacity to launch attacks from Africa is growing far faster than the ability to actually do something about cybercrime there. Okay, so one follow-up before you go away. What could this community or others do outside of your direct corporate sector to try to help influence that? I think that as there are, there are various government working groups within, within Africa, um, particularly I know that, you know, Afrinic has a lot of government working groups, etc. I think it would be very helpful to have an international presence of those saying these are the effects of attacks that we're seeing and you need to do something about it because we need some external pressure as well as the internal pressure to come down on the governments, etc. of Africa to do something about it. Because if it's purely internal, right. it, you get far less reaction. Okay, excellent. Right. Um, as a follow-up to the previous speaker, uh, the question comes to mind as, um, let's say, active mitigation or active retaliation. I heard it from a couple of vendors a few times past this year that they've been hit by amplification attack, and if it's not stops in the next 24 hours, they will start actively suppress servers that are initiating the second stage of amplification attack. And how good is that? I mean, this will only make things worse. This will only cause more outages all, all over the internet. Right. Is that acceptable? Why are people having these strange ideas? What's the community opinion on this? I think it's by doing the bad things, you're becoming a bad guy. Right. Um, so specifically some of the attacks against the financial sector a year or so ago, uh, those kinds of DOS attacks where an entity has sort of an existential threat to their business model if their web front end doesn't work and you have sometimes hundreds of thousands, millions of devices that can be used for reflection. In those kinds of circumstances, there is pressure by the people who are the victims to stop it What's the alternative? And, and you should so realize how... that it uh, multiplies uh, the collateral damage, as oh, I yeah. said, by order of magnitude. And it's it's let's just consider that it's not an option. No no matter how bad you hit, no matter what your losses are, it's just not an option. Retaliation is not an option. Right. So then, if there was a group that was doing review, after action review of these kinds of things. Uh, 
what kind of momentum could that group have in not naming and shaming directly, but just making it really clear that the collateral damage issue should take some precedent over, you know, they may be losing millions of dollars in business in these DOS attacks. How do you then equate direct financial harm with impact to a large number of innocent people who just lose any ability to use the internet for a few days? Build your infrastructure wisely. Consider all these risks prior before you get hit. I actually had a conversation with somebody and that was my point to them. EDOS is a known issue. There are known solutions and they involve over provisioning or having a provider in place to mitigate. After you are attacked, saying my only option now is to counter attack doesn't seem to be the right one. But that's something that they should have done in the past that they didn't do. How do we get them, how do we get people to think about making sure that their infrastructure is resilient and do the things that everybody here is promoting? That's the hard part. No answer to this question. <laughs> Let's keep trying to find one. Thank you. Uh, back in the back. I'm Michael Thompson, Argonne National Labs. Um, I think it's a really interesting problem area. We've been looking at um, doing some laboratory experiments in this direction as well. I think that, um, and this is just my personal opinion, but I think we've been sort of blessed and lucky that the internet is still kind of this wild west um, sort of attitude. Um, and a lot of us who come from sort of an operations background, you know, we like that. Um, but the real truth is that even in the states, the government and law enforcement don't have the either ability or resources or technical um, uh, ability to step in and do anything about a large amount of these threats. So we have companies like Microsoft stepping in and doing it, you know, for them, going rogue essentially. Um, and I think, you know, this community and other communities that have the ability to show leadership I think, you know, um, in some ways, uh, I, don't know that, I don't know that I can say that we have a responsibility, but if, if we don't step in and take leadership on this issue and acknowledge that the internet will not be the Wild West for forever, governments are going to step in and do it for us, and we're probably not going to like the results. Um, so uh, just, again, sort of my opinion, I think, you know, as much as possible, those of us in leadership positions need to step in and start making policy and start trying to influence the legal system to, um, you know, take a more proactive view of this in a way that technically makes sense instead of, you know, letting lawmakers do it, you know, sort of reactionarily. Sounds good. Um, before you sit down, can you, are, are, are you aware of efforts within your organization or peers, since you're a national lab, that maybe not be the best set of peers to consider. Are you aware of efforts to try to um, come up with model legislation or policy changes that will affect that? Is there anything that you think you can promote or just have this group, the experts in this room, exert their influence? Um, I was going to come and ask you that after the meeting with your interactions with DHS S&T. Um, I think that's probably where it's going to have to start from is from somewhere in Homeland Security, but um, no, I'm not aware of any efforts to that effect. Okay. Just to comment on what the previous speaker was saying about how governments react when other people don't react. I had a situation a little while back where we had a problem on the network and the counterterrorism unit showed up at my door. And they said, well, you guys haven't done anything about it because at that point we actually couldn't because of contractual obligations. So they said, well, now we're telling you to. And I said, have you got a court order? They said, no, we don't have a court order, but you've got a choice. You either do something about it or we'll just take you away to jail. And there you will sit for who knows how long and forget due process. So yes, governments can be a little bit nasty if you don't take a, a, your, your own action and do something. They can get really, really nasty. And I mean, that's an extreme case, but it's becoming more and more like that by the day, particularly in our area of the world. Very interesting. I think this is probably the last question here. 
Yeah, just a quick note, actually, to Michael's comment about uh, the government being involved. We also have to be careful because there's a, you know, the internet is international thing, and a lot of those uh, will happen across a lot of different jurisdictions. And um, having a particular government involved uh, may also look like this government in being is being biased to achieve particular goals. So, um, may also be good to consider a completely non-government based organization or uh, approach to this uh, again through the legal system but not sponsored in particular by the government of any country for that matter yeah, that makes sense. all right um, should this be the end timekeepers okay um, so just in uh, conclusion here um, as Krazi was just alluding, um, having a, a group of people, non-governmental, trying to do some things, uh, and, and several of the speakers here, I'm, I'm hearing the same thing, that there needs to be active engagement, there needs to be some pressure put on governments to do the things that are necessary to improve legal capacity, improve laws, improve policies, but also doing things in a way that works with the fact that the internet is international. So I'd encourage anybody else, uh, somebody said they were going to come up and talk with me later. I'll hang out here for a little while. If anybody wants to follow up on this discussion, if you want to be involved in this, come and contact me, give me a business card. Um, we are trying, or there's a group of people who are trying to at least put some documentation together to describe the best way to go about this. And I want to make sure that the platform providers and the network providers are considered and involved to as much of a degree as possible in going forward and doing more aggressive things to minimize the collateral damage that's been put. So thanks everybody.